I know quite a few people in the room. I'm Chris, also at RBC in the uh, Data and Analytics Group. Um, I work closely with Amir, with Asan, with Brian, most others. So I'm excited to be here. Glad that uh, you wanted to hear a little bit about uh, deep contextualized word representations. I heard quite a few people in the back, especially over on this side, talk about NLP. That's bad. It means you can call me on all the things in here. Just <laughs> pretend you don't know anything about it for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. But uh, we'll get along just fine. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, number one, um, I woke up with some weird things with my ears this morning. So if I'm too loud or too quiet, let me know. Um, just want to make sure everyone can hear me, but I'm not deafening you. And second, I'm going to steal a joke from Mitch Hedberg here. I feel like all of you know something that I don't, because I'm the only one in the room facing this way. Um, <laughs> this format works great for talks, um, but I want this to be more of a discussion. I know it's a little bit awkward with everyone sort of facing the front here, but don't wait for the end. Don't uh, sort of, if there's a natural pause, jump in, ask a question, get involved. All right. So with that, let's get started. So I'm going to talk to you about deep contextualized word representations. And th I found this a surprisingly simple method for task-specific tuning of language embeddings. That's just reading straight up the slide here. And I say surprisingly um, because I ended up fitting this entire technique, all the sort of the core components, on just one slide. And I thought, this must have been a couple of guys out of the pub who suddenly, oh, you know what, that's, that's easy. We should go back to the lab and try that. And they did that in an hour or two. And they got this paper out of it. And this paper received, um, uh, it was selected for publication at iClear. They did a dual submission, which got them some finger wagging. Uh, but uh, despite the, don't let the sort of simple mechanics of it throw you off. Uh, the results are quite good. Hey, it works. Um, it's just for structure, we're going to, a little bit of an overview of uh, what this is, why we're talking about it. Um, I'll give some background on NLP, specifically on language models and embeddings. If everybody in the room already knows this, throw popcorn at me or something and we can move it along quickly. Uh, we'll talk about this particular model formulation and architecture. Um, and talk about some of the results listed in the paper, what I thought, what I liked about them, what I didn't like about them, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion. <coughs> Sound good? So who wrote the paper? Uh, in, a, in a moment, it'll be up on the screen. There's five of them and the names <coughs> escape me. Um, so the technique, they call it ELMO, uh, Embeddings from Language Models. And that title, Deep Contextualized Word Representations, uh, just breaks down exactly like you think it would. Deep, neural network, uh, probably wouldn't have invited to speak about this if it wasn't some kind of neural network method. Uh, contextualized, most embedding methods, or most of the popular embedding methods, um, they're just a function of the word, uh, which we, we want to go a little bit deeper. We want the word in the context in which it appears. It gives it a little bit more semantic uh, meaning. Uh, word. Um, for this paper, we're going to be treating words as the fundamental semantic unit. If someone is uh, peeking in, it's, it's okay to come in. <laughs> um, words are the semantic unit that we're going to consider. So we will talk a little bit about characters, but as we talk here today, it's mostly about words as a construct of language. And then embedding uh, for representation. We all know that with word to vac or Glob or FastX, uh, a dense machine-readable representation of language is a super useful thing to have. So we're going to be talking about embeddings today. And the paper in question is by Peters, Neumann, Iyer, Gardner, Clark, Lee, and Zellenmoyer. Uh, these are from the University of Washington and the Allen Lab. Um, this is a fairly distinguished group of people. Um, among them, they have co-publications with Bengio, Graves, Cho, um, Mikolov, others. Uh, a lot of good work comes out of this lab. So I was uh, excited to see this paper show up. And then a little bit of background, uh, just to get everyone on the same page about language models, embeddings, etc. Uh, first of all, natural language traditionally is really hard to work with, with computers, with machines. Uh, because the representation is strange, it's variable length, it's sparse. If we do things like one-hot encodings, we end up with massive vocabulary cardinalities. It's just an absolute pain. Um, and that's why we turn to embeddings, which is just that dense numeric representation of language. And ideally, uh, a good embedding will be have an efficient, dense representation. It'll be context aware. So it's not just a function of the word, but it's a function of the word in the context that it appears. Context is very, very important in language. 
And then, ideally, we'll have uh, valid vector math operators that are semantic in nature rather than syntactic. These turn out to be really useful for a lot of real world, real world applications for comparing similarity. How do we um, create and combine these embeddings? Um, we already have quite a few good options out there for context insensitive embeddings. Uh, Word to Vec being the first one that kicked off in uh, 2013 with Thomas Mikulov. Uh, Glove following, and then a little bit later, Fast Text out of Facebook? Yeah, Facebook. Um, so lots of good uh, open source implementations of context insensitive options. Um, but context aware, a little bit newer, not as many good examples. And I particularly like where this paper takes it. And we've all seen this before. Um, this is Word to Vec. Ideally, we want those operations. I want to be able to do the um, king minus man plus woman is approximately equal to queen. I want to be able to look at the angle between. I even want to be able to take averages. I want all the math. Uh, so that's why uh, we, that's one of the reasons we care so much about these dense representations. And I care about context. Chris attended the play at the Shaw Festival. Chris didn't want to play bridge. It was a context insensitive model. Play gets the same representation, the same meaning either way, when clearly the semantics of the, the word play in those two sentences is quite different. I did just attend a play at the Shaw Festival. It was great. Everyone should go. Um, so in a context-aware model, um, the, uh, the embedding is a function of both the word and the context. And I deliberately haven't defined exactly what I mean by context so far, because that's kind of open for discussion. A natural unit of context matches with some of our natural units of language, like sentences, paragraphs, documents, news articles, texts, tweets. Um, for the purposes of today, we're going to treat context as sentences, but nothing that I'm going to talk about is sentence specific. You can have as big a context or as local a context as you want. Um, this, uh, we use recurrent neural network structures, LSTMs or GRUs, heavily in this work. Uh, so that means that uh, a reasonable amount of context is great, but even though they theoretically have an unbounded receptive field, in practice, 20, 30, maybe 40 words is about as well as they do before they start to you know, implicitly forget things, uh, not represent as well. And this is sort of a vanilla language model architecture. You can find this all over the place. I'll just take a look, let you absorb for one second before I start discussing it. So right here at the bottom, the representation, that's whatever language representation we start with. Usually words, we're going to treat it like it's words for this example. And then we pass it up through these recurrent structures. These are going to read over the sequence. You can see the one on the left is reading forwards, and the one on the right is reading backwards. Um, from that, we obtain this sequence of states or outputs from the uh, recurrent structures. And a softmax on top is uh, the training mechanism. Um, mathematically, if you look over here, I'm, what I claim is that the likelihood of this sequence of tokens, this sentence, um, is the product of the greedy model, which is the probability of any word given all the words that preceded it. Probably not exactly true, but good enough. Um, we know that uh, empirically this works well. So this is the definition of a language model that we're going to go with today. Uh, and then for some model, it's parameterized by theta. We train this by maximizing the log likelihood of that token given everything that came before it and the sum over the entire sequence. Now, you might notice that what I have written up there doesn't exactly match the model. I've only written the forward direction. The reverse as well uh, works. So you can also treat this as the probability of any token is a, uh, is a function of all the tokens that come after it, reading backwards. And for most modern language models, we go bidirectional. We use both. So for any given token, it's the, you try and maximize the likelihood of um, the likelihood of the distribution of words over that token given everything that came before and given everything that came after separately. Would that surrogate function then be the sum of the two? It or? is the sum of the two, yeah. And I just got lazy and realistically just wouldn't fit on the slide, so I just wrote the one. 
And an example of what it might look like during training, let's say that the token I'm processing right now is x1. The forward model has uh, processed token x0 and produced representation h0. The backwards recurrent structure has processed tokens 3 and 2 in that order. You can see I've kind of grayed out number 3 here. It, we receive that representation. We throw it away. Um, we want a fixed length representation here, not variable. So then reading backwards, we only want the H2 token, or the H2 representation. And then we train that with uh, softmax. So we have softmax <coughs> layer parameterized, just like any other softmax layer. And um, we try to maximize the likelihood, or minimize the negative log likelihood. And then, OK, now that we've trained this model, we've uh, we come up with a good parameterization. We, as usual, we, top, we chop off that top softmax layer. And all we really care about, the thing we're after, is that internal representation. So we do an element-wise concatenation of the uh, forward representation and the backward representation. Those become the word vectors, the representation that we're after in this context aware language model. So the representation of token x0 becomes the concatenation of the forward state at word 0 and the backward state at word 0. For the forward state, it hasn't seen anything yet, so it's going to be fairly basic. For the backward state, it's gone all the way through the sequence in reverse. It's had time to build up a lot of states, so that's likely going to be more meaningful. As you proceed through h1 all the way up to hn, uh, it walks along the sequence. Very kind of vanilla language model. Um, not the only way we can formulate and represent the problem, but it's, uh, it's a model that works well. So that's why we uh, stick with this one. Yeah. Yes. Suppose you have multiple layer of RSTM, so the input from the lower layer to higher layer still is uh, concatenated. Um, you, excellent, good question. You got ahead of me. I was going to talk about that in a little bit. I'll talk about it now. You can, in fact, stack multiple layers of these recurrent structures on top of each other. Um, it's a totally valid thing to do, and uh, many people have tried it, usually with uh, slightly improved results. Um, one thing of note is as you stack these layers on top of each other, you maintain the columnar structure. If you put cross connections in, then you've thrown away the, uh, the sequence processing that's so important to not mixing future information into the model. The way we formulate it is that the forward side only contains information from tokens before the token of consideration, and the reverse one only considers information from tokens after the token of consideration. So it's like a separate press for forward and backward? It's a totally separate pass for forward and backward. You can stack as many of these as you want on top of each other, and standard practice is then only to use the last layer, the top layer, for your representation. Yeah. If you train the model on the local, Context? Uh, so this model here, um, this, uh, the context that I'm assuming for this model here is a sentence. So local means anything within the same sentence, whether that's five tokens or 500 tokens. Um, usually sentences in English, I had this stat at the fingertips at one point. I think the average English, sen English sentence is 14 or 15 words in length, and um, sort of the 75th percentile is under 20. Um, that means that that's well within the sort of uh, realm of what an LSTM or GRU can efficiently represent without forgetting information. Yeah. So if you, with this model, if you have two, you have, uh, two same word in one sentence, they can actually correspond to two different outputs. Right? In this model, if you have the same word appearing twice in a sentence, it is possible and in fact extremely likely that they'll have different representations because this model as presented is context aware because we have those recurrent structures reading over the sequence one way or the other. Yeah. Could you please take the mathematical first mathematical equation? Back to there. So here uh, it is, uh, was it right that uh, x is the probability on right hand side of the product? Given yeah. x, xk given x0, x1 up to xk minus 1 uh, in place of that, uh, xk given x0, x1 up to xk minus 1 and xk plus 1 up to xn. So looking at the whole sentence except for the existing, yeah, yeah. the current so token we're looking at, um, that looks very similar to Mikhailov's word to vec formulation of this problem. Okay. Um, certainly it's possible there's, like I said, there's multiple ways to formulate this. 
Um, I like this way because it, it brings a temporal aspect to the sentence as if you were a listener, someone telling you the sentence forward, you only, at any given time you only have information from what you've already heard, uh, or someone saying the sentence to you backwards, I don't know why anyone would do that, it would be really weird, but it's certainly possible. What about grammar? Sorry, yeah. Grammar rules? Um, we, ha we have no assumption of grammar rules, of um, language structure that's entirely inferred from the data presented to it in this model. Totally ignored. Uh, sorry, I'm totally thinking. ignored. Um, so I, I'm going to agree with you and say totally ignored, but instead I'm going to put a spin on it and say, I'm going to say inferred. Grammar rules are inferred from the data rather than um, a priori provided to the model. Um, I've not told them all anything about English grammar. In fact, I've said nothing about the English language here, except for a few examples, because I only speak English. Mm -hmm. um, this could be any language. So what if the inference is not exact or accurate? Uh, there's a fair amount of literature that discusses the addition of explicit grammars and grammar rules into uh, neural network uh, language models. Um, I, for, mostly for simplicity, I prefer models that attempt to infer that uh, grammatic structure, um, but there's lots of literature that explore that idea. Mostly because I'm very lazy and I don't want to have to figure out how to encode lots of grammar rules into a model. No, it's, to be fair, it's also because they, we've been using them for 50 years and they didn't work as well. And that's, that's why. <laughs> Though there are a number of uh, natural language tasks that explicitly look at inferring the uh, grammatical or um, uh, the, word I'm looking for, the grammatical structure of a sentence. Grammar induction. Asan knows more about natural language processing than I do, so I'm going to let him respond to questions. <laughs> I like it that way. All right. Um, let's talk about the model at hand. That was just background to bring us on to sort of the uh, same page. Now we're going to talk about ELMO, which I think is a great name for a model. Um, so we're going to start from that standard language model architecture we just talked about, and we're going to incorporate three ideas. One, use multiple layers of recurrent units. So rather than just a single recurrent layer, we're going to use two or three or ten or a hundred, whatever is appropriate for the problem. Uh, second, is we're going to keep all of the internal layer representations, not only the last one. And third, for any downstream task, I'm going to create a task-specific fixed length embedding as a linear combination of all those um, internal representations. This is the part about tuning it for the task at hand. And this is the entire paper on one slide. What was the third one? For any downstream, so this is about customization of the embedding for a task. So uh, sentiment, uh, sentiment analysis, very different from grammar induction, or even two sentiment analysis tasks from each other in different domains. This gives us an easy, simple, and very computationally cheap way of customizing this model for each task. So essentially, you keep multiple layers as your representation and do linear combinations of those. Right, right at consumption time, yes. So it's like, instead of giving you the final product, you just give you a bunch of building blocks. Uh, that's right. This gives you a, uh, a bunch of building blocks. Now, these building blocks are trained independently of whatever task you're working on, and you just take a final task-specific tuning pass right at consumption time. So it's not like you're retraining the entire model for every task. So you have, uh, you have representations for context-dependent words, right? Yeah. So how do you use that in when you're like trying to, when you have like a new, you have another word in a new context, and how, how, does, how, how does that apply then? Um, so if I understand your question correctly, uh, whenever you encounter a, a word in context, you want to, you want to be able to see sort of different representation. I'm not sure. Well, it's kind of like the, the question that was asked before, because if you see two words in, in the same context, yeah. but not, but they'll have different meanings because they have that sequential nature to them, right? So okay. like how? So, so, you, so I, th I think I understand your question. You you can have two words, the same word, in the same context. I'm using the word context loosely here to mean inside the same sentence. Yeah. Um, 
Oh, I, I'd say a tighter definition of the word context here is in the sentence, in the g given the words that have already appeared in sequence order. So even though there are two words that are the same or in the same sentence, the context is actually different. Similar, perhaps, but different. All right. So yeah. do you mean the, when you are the number three, you do a uh, weighted sum of the the embeddings? Of it the is a it is a weighted sum of the embeddings. Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you learn the weight? I uh, will show you. <laughs> um, this is the core idea of the paper, all fit on one slide. This is why I say it's surprisingly simple. There's not a whole lot to it. Yeah, see a hand back there? Uh, maybe just um, back on the question. Uh, maybe, is it pre-trained uh, visualization that we can download? Maybe because it depends on the context, the way the time you run it, you have to... Uh, so if the model is defined by the architecture plus all the parameters that go into it, um, the vast majority of the parameters are pre-trained. There's a few parameters that are only trained at task uh, consumption time. So most of the parameters are pre-trained, which is why I feel comfortable calling it a pre-trained model. Um, but then there's a few that, are, that you wait until task time to train. All right. Um, this architecture uh, it looks really similar to what we just saw. I abstracted away a little bit of detail. We still have the sequence of tokens X as the input. And then we, now we have L layers of stacked recurrent units in that bicolumnar structure that we talked about. Um, L could be anything from one all the way up through a number so large that it's never going to effectively train. Um, and the representation for a token like I said, we're not just looking at the top recurrent layer anymore. We're looking at the representation from all L layers. So you can see here the representation of a token is just this set of the original token representation. It's always helpful to have that original token representation. And then for every layer J from 1 all the way up to L. And then for the token K that we're interested in the forward representation and the backward representation for each one of those layers. So if, if we have L layers, then we're going to have 2 to the L plus 1, or 2 times L plus 1 components of this representation. Yeah? So is this SQD a tensor? Um, so it, it's a, in this case, it's a vector. In th this HK is a vector. Um, because we have J going from 1 to L, K refers to a single token. Each one of these H's is a vector. What this kind of uh, K comma J representation used for tensor? I, I, I know. This, this is what the paper uses. Um, I'm sticking with it because uh, it is actually fairly meaningful if you view it as the indexes in a collection of vectors. You could put them all together to form a tensor, but this representation works nicely on the uh, description. So this is still uh, satisfy the efficiency criteria that you had because what if xk is very sparse? Uh, I will talk about that. Um, <coughs> yeah. Um, all, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask, isn't xk like uh, one hot vector usually? In this example, I haven't said anything about it. In yeah. this example on the screen, let's assume that xk is a one hot vector, which again, not, not super desirable, causes us a lot of problems if the cardinality of uh, the dictionary is huge. There are about 175,000 words, uh, active words in the English language. About three or 4,000 of them are in common usage. Um, so even if we only looked at the common words and threw away all of the uncommon words, uh, we're still looking at a very sparse space where one element of three or 4,000 is active. That's not great, and we do discuss a way to uh, deal with that in a few slides. That way we're going to talk about is not a contribution of this paper, but they make use of it to good effect. Um, just for notation's sake, we're going to condense this selection of um, components here down into this H representation here. And all we've done is say that for the token layer, for HK0, it's just equal to the, uh, to the input to the token. And for HKJ, it's just the concatenation of whichever particular layer we're at. So for token K, we concatenate the vector from here and the vector from here. 
I haven't changed anything, I haven't done anything to the vectors there, I've just concatenated them and made the uh, notation more friendly. And now we talk about how we do that weighted uh, combination of those uh, um, layer-wise internal representations. And it's exactly as simple as you think it is. It's just the weighted sum where the weights are these SJ tasks times this representation here. So um, what we've said is that the, the weight vector, those S tasks, we pass it through a um, softmax. So they all sum to one, it forms a probability distribution that just keeps everything roughly the same scale, no matter what combination you're um, collecting these internal representations in. We also have this gamma multiplier in front of it. Um, this is one of, what, one of the things I found most unsatisfying about the paper. They claim that this gamma is necessary to effectively train this model on quite a few of the problems. And then they provide very little justification for why that is, apart from a little paragraph about making sure that everything is appropriately, that all the vectors are appropriately the same length, approximately the same length. I don't find that a very uh, sort of helpful uh, blurb, but I want to talk about that later, see if anyone has a little bit more insight on why that is than I do. Um, note that these SJs and this gamma, those are trainable parameters, and those are the task trainable parameters. You have one trainable parameter for every L layer of this model, so if you have 10, if L is equal to 10, <coughs> then you're going to have 10 of these S parameters, and you have one gamma parameter that does the uh, scaling of the entire weighted sum. That's a much smaller number of parameters to deal with than retraining this whole model. So uh, I didn't get what is task here in this context. Uh, so in this context, task, uh, that just denotes the particular task in which you're modifying the representation for. If I were to train this whole model um, not considering the uh, task, uh, just, like we did with, just like we did with that vanilla language model a little bit earlier, um, I would come up with the task-independent in, task uh, parameterization, the task-independent representation you see here. I can have a separate vector of these SJ values for every task I'm interested in. One for uh, sentiment analysis on, uh, on tweets, one for sentiment analysis on news articles, one for grammar induction. I don't have to change this model at all. This just lets me identify which task I'm working on. Is this gamma one dimensional or two dimensional? Sorry? Is it gamma one dimensional or two dimensional? Gamma is a scalar. Oh, it's a scalar. Yeah. So gamma just acts as a, uh, you can view it as a regularizer or you can just view it as a, a scaling factor. A task, task specific learned scaling factor on the weighted sum of all the internal representation vectors. Are SJ fixed overall tokens? Uh, sorry, which ones? SJ. SJ? Um, yeah, so SJ is fixed over all the internal representations at layer J. So at the first layer, you have one single scalar SJ, uh, no matter which uh, K position you're at through here. That is a very small number of parameters that are trainable at task time. And what it represents, this just represents the the distribution over the internal representations. If any one of these SJ is equal to one, all the others are going to be zero because it's a softmax. And that means that you're saying use only this layer <coughs> representation and ignore all others. So it's just the, uh, the way that how, it just tells you how to combine those internal representations to form the final representation. But then it'd be fixed over all tokens, right? It is fixed over all okay. tokens, yes. Yeah. So gamma, gamma depends on the length you wish to keep for the algorithm? That's what they claim in the paper. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, gamma is just some trainable parameter for the task. Every task gets to train it, it's a single scalar, and it comes out better. That is intensely unsatisfying. <laughs> um, so uh, did you said uh, the architecture of only just has column connections between layers? Yeah, so, so you, no, there's no cutting across. Okay. Uh, be, that would amount to violating uh, essentially temporal causality. You only want to consider tokens okay. before um, your current token for forward pass or after your current token for the backward pass. I mean, what if you are 
normalize your data will input your, the, what representation to your task. Is the government still useful? Maybe. Again, I want to. <laughs> so, even if I were to normalize the length of this, mm -hmm. um, technically gamma could still be used in this formulation to change the length of that normalized vector to whatever the downstream task found appropriate. Um, what I'm going on here is just that it seems to work better. And uh, I'll be completely honest, I don't really know why. So uh, can I just put, try to sort in a little bit of insight? Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps it help, it's helpful. I'm not sure what exactly the purpose is, but um, vector length isn't usually, um, so for a lot of NLP tasks, it's the vector's angle that's, that, that makes sense. And vector length is usually disregarded. Um, and that's, that's uh, because of the frequency effect. So a lot of words are just very frequent, so they result in huge vectors. Uh, and then you can't compare them with anything else. Um, so I'd say um, for any task that's um, partially or fully dependent on the vector length, perhaps it could be um, useful. Um, for the tasks that are um, virtually um, angle dependent, I'm not sure how helpful it is, but maybe you'll... What, what is an example in each case? So, um, semantic similarity or cosine similarity um, necessarily only relies on the vector's angles, like the angles between the vectors. Um, if you use other uh, types of distance, say Euclidean or Descartes, then uh, you're relying to some extent on the vector's length. But what I mean, like, what are, like, for example, text classification might be an example. So I, I say any task, um, I mean, I haven't thought about it carefully, but I say any, time this, uh, any task that solely relies on semantics, uh, say spam detection, um, what else? Um, for a lot of tasks, I can't really remember anything um, other than that. But um, any task that doesn't require any frequency information, um, then you definitely use cosine because you don't you want to get rid of the length of the vector. Yeah, I have something to tell about that. Uh, in work to work also, the vectors are normalized vectors, and so the only uh, to see the cluster. For example, uh, father and mother have their vector representation. Uh, those vectors are having smaller angle between them father, mother, son, so they make cluster. And the cluster in uh, the vectors is made like uh, the vectors with less angles. So one, uh, so that king and man, yeah. woman and everything. So that's how they are mapped, such that uh, the closure words, the words which have a close relation, they have smaller angle between them. So they are close in the sense of their cosine angles, as you say. But uh, here it is, uh, how the uh, is it followed? So empirically, with most of the embedding tasks I've tried, including context-aware embeddings, uh, the difference in relative distance uh, as you examine uh, some sort of word similarity, it's very similar between using the Euclidean distance between them, which is magnitude-aware, or using the cosine distance between them, which is not, mag or not particularly magnitude-aware. Um, in practice, my experience is that embeddings that are embeddings that are located at length one, i.e., on the unit hypersphere, um, work just fine. Which is one of the reasons I find this result so confounding. Um, there's another interesting piece of work that um, I think it was Kyung Hyun Cho supervised that uh, looks at the principal components of um, various embeddings and found that uh, the the new axes in the transform space from those embeddings line up very well with independent semantic concepts. Uh, so if I was to look at the word, um, see now I'm on this, the word play, the one I used before, and run it, the embedding through, from one of the other embedding techniques through PCA, um, the principal axis of that might correspond with the semantics of game playing. And the secondary axis might correspond well with the, uh, with the uh, semantics of theater. Um, but it, that's strictly an observed empirical result. I don't have good uh, sort of uh, justification for why that might be. Yeah. Well, well, there, there can be another interpretation. I mean, I'm assuming um, that result is going is actually log softmax, right? Uh, Elmo of, of 
Oh, so, and, and so it's maximizing the log likelihood to train yeah, the softmax? So, yeah, so, so gamma task can be seen maybe as a temperature parameter. Uh, but I need to know what you're using it for to yeah. figure out what, what exactly. Yeah, and what you're using it for, the, uh, the unfortunate answer is anything you want to. <laughs> um, I'm guess I'm looking at this paper right now. Yeah. It actually gives a, uh, it says gamma is important. And, see and then the supplementary material is just at the end of the paper there, yeah. and the explanation is still unsatisfying. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of guessing, is it because of the uh, practical uh, numerical problem? Because sometimes the uh, value just gets too small, so you have to multiply the, the factor? That wasn't something that was raised. Um, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I can't imagine that it would get, the number would get so small that precision or underflow would be a particular uh, concern, but it's possible. Anything else? Should I move on? It, it's very easy to imagine how the angle would matter, but yeah. the size, like the question that I was asking, like I can't, like how about like LDA and that, that like, topic modeling type of things that look at the frequency of terms. <coughs> yeah, so, yeah, no, I agree. Like, in, in, in LDA and, like, LSA, well, to, not LSA, in LDA, um, like, it, it also, it matters, like, how, to some extent, how frequent the term is in the document. Or, um, but again, I can't really make it, like, direct connection. Yeah, usually, it, it, it's been the case that in semantics, usually you want to get rid of you want, you want the vector not to influence um, uh, the, uh, the judgment between the borders, um, per se. So, and, and, but that's purely semantic. Do I see a question on uh, that? Uh, as I uh, said a lot about the map of the vector and meaning of the mind, mm -hmm. I just found in a forum, actually, <coughs> that uh, if the term is very frequent in the context, the length will be shorter. Means that it will be closer to the center. If it's a ray or uh, the length will be longer. So it could be well. I so I can see. Well, I don't. I don't see how the kind of the whole task share gamma would affect any particular um, vector because it's a it's a shared multiplier on every. Um, or on the sum, the weighted sum of all the vectors. Um, I do see where you're coming from. I'm still very confused. Yeah. So, like, to, like for any for any semantic task, I don't see it changing the results uh, if it's purely semantics because it's not going to change the angle exactly. between the, the words. But we'll, uh, I think we should. Listen all right. To <laughs> 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 no, I knew that this slide would be where the sort of the meat of the discussion happened because. Um, Really, this is the core of the paper if it's all on this one slide. Everything else that we've talked about is just sugar around this. Um, so I guess my next question was, is this representation better? Is it worth doing this? Um, so there is a base case where gamma is 1, and the, the task-specific weight for the last layer is equal to 1, meaning all the other task weights are, or um, layer-specific weights are 0. In which case, this is identical to a vanilla language model with the same number of layers. So at the very least, this is going to be as good or has the potential to be as good as the language model we talked about before. Um, there's a tantalizing fragment in the related work section of this paper that says, previous work has also shown that different layers of deep bidirectional RNNs encode different types of information. And it gives a couple of references to explore that. Um, that's interesting because it, th this technique gives you an option to unlock some or all of that different meaning at the different layers of internal representation. Um, that is uh, what I think what the authors are saying and what I theorize as well is where the additional lift that we'll talk about on most tasks using these vectors comes from. It's that ability to capture information contained not only at the final layer but internal layers of the uh, network. Too far. Um, so then, how do you use this in practice? In practice, this is super easy to use. Um, in any model, in any situation, we're going to you're going to use some language representation e of input. It could be words, it could be characters, whatever you want. Um, 
we're just going to concatenate the ELMO vector with this. And then we're going to train those, um, we're going to train those task specific parameters. And like I said, there's a very small number of them. So it, it adds very, very little to the training complexity or cost. Um, and so to set the gamma task and that S task vector, um, we freeze the parameters of the language model that we trained, um, that we used to generate RK. And then we just train gamma and S as parameters in whatever task specific model we're working on. There's examples in this paper of six or seven um, other, work, uh, other works, other models that they attach this to. And in every case, the only change they made to the architecture of those models was to append these ELMO vectors and train the task specific parameters. And in every case, the, they show the results getting better. Now, take that with a grain of salt. No one's going to publish a paper where the results don't look better. But we'll get to that. Yeah. It's not clear what E is, like it's a language representation? Uh, any language representation. So it could be, I'm sorry, I, I should have written X there. It's um, whatever representation you're using before, one hot vectors or embeddings. anything you want. Other embeddings, embeddings from uh, word to vac or glove. Or... Sorry, I switched up the um, nomenclature ha or the representation halfway through the presentation. So I want to take just a moment to talk about inputs. This is not a contribution to this paper, but they did discuss um, a, a solution to exactly that problem that was mentioned a few minutes ago which was, we haven't done anything to address what I said up front was a difficulty around representations. Those long, sparse um, vectors coming into most language models. And, um, see here's my stats. I, I was on point with the English word. So, um, it's still awkward to use those long representations, whether they're 175,000 dimensional or whether they're only 3,000 dimensional. Those are both still annoying and terrible and sparse. Um, but instead of words, um, a lot of language models are exploring the use of subword units, um, usually characters. I've also seen exploration of phonemes or graphemes, um, but characters are something that, at least for the uh, Indo-European family of languages, we understand them well. There's not too many of them. Um, for example, English has the 26 <coughs> lowercase letters. You can include 26 uppercase letters if you want. It contains 10 digits and then some double handful of common punctuation characters that might get included in words for a overall dimensionality of your input of less than 100. Less than 100 is much better than 3,000 or 175,000. Um, but it's not clear that subunit uh, or subword units like characters are necessarily an appropriate representation to pass straight to an LSTM or a GRU. In fact, I can tell you that they're not. Not even if you play some tricks around word boundaries. Uh, something that's showing up in the literature uh, frequently that this paper takes advantage of is, um, first of all, running those character representations through a CNN, a, a one-dimensional convolutional neural network. And what that's discovering is sort of common fragments, common word fragments, common uh, pairs of characters, triplets of characters, or longer, um, that form the true building blocks of English words. Um, for example, EI and IE, um, it would be two tokens if I was representing it just as two characters, but those are two very frequent combinations which could be represented with a single special token each. That could be one of the uh, patterns or <coughs> filters that the CNN learns. There are quite a few papers that discuss how to do this, efficient ways to represent it, that show you results around this. Um, I put one of them here. There's another one in the uh, references at the end of this presentation. Um, they're great reads, but they're out of scope of what we're talking about here. So for what we're talking about here, um, just assume that we have a way of starting with characters, passing it through a CNN, and then proceeding with the rest of this model just as described. Now that brings the advantages of one, the more compact representation we talked about, but two, um, out of vocabulary words. In the um, 175,000 or 3,000 words in the English language, uh, sparse one hot representation, if I come across a word I've never seen before, like a proper noun, um, it's entirely possible that I don't know how to represent it and I have to either throw it away or use some unknown token. Where in this case, uh, because all words in English are made up of those characters I talked about, we have a way of representing all words, even if they've never been seen before. 
We may not do a great job on a completely unseen word, but it's not unrepresentable. Uh, how do you use SCNN? Uh, so it, it's a little bit uh, tricky, but essentially you have several different lengths of um, character, of one dimensional sequence, i.e., character representation, that each filter size is looking at. You have some number of uh, filters, just like you would for an image, except we're only working in one dimension, not two. Um, and then at the end, it has a special pooling operation for how to combine all of those different filters that we looked at into a single fixed length representation. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a little bit unintuitive, but it's an interesting uh, line of experimentation. Uh, this paper has a good description of it, as well as one of the papers in the references at the end. Um, so how, how do you train it? How do you train it? Uh, end to end, just like before. These convolutional layers are just attached to the bottom of that language model that we talked about, and you're still training towards the log likelihood, just like uh, the rest of this. So this is just one layer of convolutional from one Usually it's one, one uh, set of convolutions of different lengths, uh, two, three, four, I think it usually goes as high as five or six, and then you have a special pooling operation. Yeah. So I guess like for language like Chinese, like you'd have to do the one on. Uh, Chinese is a <laughs> difficult language for many language models. Uh, we are getting better at it, but it poses unique challenges. Some people try to parse Chinese as an image instead of that works. Which is a very interesting <laughs> idea because the, the pictograms often are um, because me meaningful, meaningful in their visual representation as well as just the character they or the semantic language unit they represent. Yeah. I do yeah. not speak any um, dialect or flavor of uh, Chinese, so I cannot comment. But Makes sense. Somebody should <laughs> somebody should present that paper sometime. Somebody should present. Monitors? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, that would be fun. Simon, good luck here. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> you say volunteer, but I heard voluntold. <laughs> no. Um, all right, so we're moving towards wrapping up, but let's talk about a oh, few of. Oh, oh wait, uh, wait. The input to the CNN is a, yeah. a one hot. Character. It's a one-hot character encoding, but that's way lower in dimension than the one-hot word encoding. Mm -hmm. Still not super low dimension, but 70 or so is better than 3,000. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the results in the paper. Um, it's actually a little bit challenging for me to say, yes, this is a great method, or no, it's not, uh, in absence of a task, because measurement is really only meaningful in the context of the tasks that these representations are applied to. However, like all papers, um, they present a whole slew of results that show this is the state of the art. Um, I always struggle a little bit with every paper being a new state of the art. Uh, this paper was very well received from a very good lab, so I do believe that uh, these results are fairly meaningful. I have not tried to replicate these myself. I will because I'm very interested, but um, if anyone has a time machine, I could use a few extra days every week. <laughs> um, these are the tasks. These uh, six tasks are the ones presented in the paper. Um, all of these, they picked another uh, prominent example of that task from another paper, implemented the model in precisely the same way, using the original source code where available, though you know, we all know it's not often available, and um, compared that to the reported results. So the tasks are question answering with a squad data set, um, and that's sourced from 100,000 crowdsourced examples of questions and answers. Uh, textual entailment, does this sentence entail this answer, true or false? Uh, semantic rule labeling, attaching parts of grammar, parts of speech to different uh, elements of the uh, sentence. Uh, Co-reference resolution, do these two words in the sentence refer to the same uh, subject? For example, if I were to say a, word, a sentence with Chris, and then he did this, does Chris and then the pronoun he apply to the same, uh, do they reference the same person or a subject? Uh, named entity recognition, just tagging which items in a sentence uh, refer to named entities, uh, proper nouns, etc. And sentiment analysis, the sort of classic but fun task that uh, we all get asked for over and over and over. And in every case, um, you can see here, these are the uh, papers from which those examples were drawn. 
They claim that at time of publication, these were all sort of the accepted state of the art at these tasks. I have not verified that myself, but I do believe they've done their legwork. And here's the reported results from the original paper. Here's the baseline results from the re-implementation that the authors of uh, this paper did for each of those um, tasks. Uh, of note is they implemented the models exactly the same way as uh, was implemented in the original uh, paper. And then, and that's just the baseline, and then using the baseline plus adding these uh, task-specific representations, they've shown that in every case they not only improved on their own baseline, but they show that in every case they beat um, the state of the art at the time of uh, writing, uh, submitting the paper. And they show that in some cases it's a fairly small increase, uh, looking uh, in particular at uh, the SNLI, the textual entailment task, and in other cases, it's quite stark. Like if you look up at the question answering task, they're claiming a fairly significant um, improvement. Yeah. So, so Elmo plus baseline is basically your baseline uh, representations with your Elmo representations? It's using the baseline model and attaching the Elmo representations trained in a task specific way. Okay. If you read deeply into the appendices of this paper, one of the things they talk about is that um, just training this model the naive way did not pr produce the, these good results. They had to perform one final fine-tuning pass on the, on the ELMO language model, um, ignoring any labels that were attached to the task, but essentially fine-tuning the ELMO model for the particular domain language that was being used rather than just the sort of gen uh, generic domain language. It was uh, one epoch, it was not a lot of sort of timer computation, but it drastically improved their results. And now, this paper has a dubious honor, and I say dubious, because uh, it has this visualization in it. I think this is the least explanatory, worst visualization I've ever seen attached to a good paper. <laughs> because I stared at it for minutes, and I kept turning my head and looking at it. This doesn't really tell you anything until you dive deep into it. Um, what it's trying to show us here is um, the different, uh, those S, uh, uh, S values, the ones that show how much importance is being attached to each of the internal representation layers for each task. And this diagram almost doesn't tell you that. It's a terrible diagram. Uh, so as I say, this paper has this dubious honor of having the worst visualization I've seen. So wait, what does S mean for input layer and output layer? Uh, so, for these five tasks, SRL, CoREF, SLI, Squad, and SST5, um, the only place that a, um, lang a linguistic representation is present in the model is at the input, or it, there is one at the input. For these three tasks here, SNLI, Squad, and SST5, um, these actually have an output um, language layer as well. So it's not just a um, sort of a yes-no prediction task, etc. Uh, they're predicting some aspect of language at output time, and this is the application of those um, embeddings not only to the input, but also to the target output uh, of the model. Yeah, but this basically confirms that uh, you only need one of the STM layer to capture most of the information. In many cases it does, but of interest, it's not always the same one. So for example, you can see on this SRL task, if you can parse what's going on here with the, with the terrible visualization, it's saying that this layer here, this LSTM1 layer, contains most of the information. Um, no, I think that's actually true in all the cases. I think the middle layer is always <laughs> <all the ones. laughs> Good eye, I didn't catch that. It was awful visualization. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> Um, also of note is that it doesn't indicate anywhere in the paper that they tried L greater than 2. Um, they tried L equals 2, uh, which, yes, it's deeper than L equals 1. But I would have liked to see more layers of representation, and I can only speculate that after drinking all night and then going to try this in the middle of the night, they just ran out of time or budget or something. <laughs> So wait, the maximum that they tried is L equals 2, and then... The maximum they report trying is L equals right. 2. And, and the, best, the best values they get is for the first layer anyway. Yes. Well, sometimes the uh, token layer, I think... Does the token layer ever outweigh the middle layer? No. No, nope. no, it doesn't. <laughs> no, it does. Like for yes. SNLI? Yeah. But that's for the output. That's for the output. Yeah. 
Um, of note, though, is just because it's putting most weight on the middle layer doesn't mean it's only uh, relying on the middle layer. Because it's a weighted sum, in this case, it looks like it's only relying on the middle layer. But in this case, it's also blending representation from the top and bottom. So I can't say definitively that those layers could just be left out or not there. Um, but it is finding that that first LSTM layer is capturing the most useful information for coming up with a representation for these tasks. Yeah, yeah. But there's also another thing. Uh, mm -hmm. It depends also on the LSTM size. Uh, if their LSTM might have been large enough to capture a, a, a large amount of information. I, I don't know what the hidden size was. I think their LSTM size, they said, was um, 2,048 units at each layer, I think. Okay, okay yeah. But yes. for the task, for the input size, that No, no, but, but uh, I, I, I mean, we could see 2,000 hidden, uh, 2,000 neurons in the hidden layer for us. That's, that's a lot. And so that is a lot. Yeah, yeah, you would expect most of the information to already be in the LSTM one. If you, if you reduce it, I don't know, to maybe like 200 or something. Maybe, I, yeah, maybe then it would be a little bit more interesting. I say you try it and tell us. <laughs> <laughs> is this before or after you apply the gamma? Uh, this is, uh, I don't think the gamma matters in this case. I think what this is trying to show is just the, uh, the weights on those S's. Um, the gamma being applied uh, would scale the final output, but it wouldn't scale each of these individual pieces any differently. So it wouldn't change the relative weight of each of the components. Yeah, I can't claim I've entirely parsed the uh, thing graph yet, but um, is it safe to assume, um, I mean, if it's only the first layer of LSTM that's um, uh, responsible for it working well, is it possible that in the back propagation, the, layer, the, la the later layers could have affected uh, the quality of um, uh, the presentation in, 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 in that layer? It is possible. I don't have answers for you. <laughs> yeah. So they mentioned that um, the semantic information comes mostly from the outer, the topmost layer, and then the. Uh, in this case, I think it's showing us that the semantic information comes mostly from the middle layer. Um, in the traditional language model, the semantic information comes from the topmost layer because we discard all the other uh, layers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then they and then they said that the syntactic information comes more from the bottom most. Is that like? more in the traditional model, or is it what you're talking about this? Um, I would buy that to some degree, because the bottom layer is the raw tokens that haven't undergone any transformation, and you can expect to have kept many more of the syntactic features. Um, that sounds plausible to me. Oh, okay. yeah. All right. Um, so I know we've been discussing all along, but I left the whole section for it at the end. and. These are some of the questions that uh, I came up with, but I actually kind of like the ones that we uh, surface in the room a lot better. Um, other thoughts? I will come back to this, but uh, if anyone's interested, I have a related work section. These are a combination of the papers uh, cited in this paper as being important, as well as some of my favorite papers that I inserted just because I like them. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in particular, uh, I always like going back to the uh, Badenow uh, learning to, or normal machine translation paper. Yeah. It's classic, but it's a good paper. I'll leave that one up. Very costly. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Things that uh, I didn't talk about? You're going to ask all the questions. I have a couple of thoughts. Yeah. So, so one is that I like the weight sharing, which uh, it's kind of reminding me of, of, of com the uh, deconvolution the the operator because you, it's, it's easier to train, you have a smaller amount of weights. Yeah. Um, and the other, I will, so that I won't forget. Um, oh, yeah, so did they compare, if you, if you go back to the results, yeah, did they compare with, um, because if, if those were using, um, uh, we were not using subword information at all, the baselines. And then now they're using, so the improvements could be um, contributed to the um, software information per se, and less to their new architectures. Yeah, that's a good question. And in fact, one of the things they discussed in the paper is a comparison with another very similar context-aware embedding method called uh, CoVE, 
that also uses subword information. They, for each of these tasks, they also um, ran the Cove model for creating embeddings. And um, Cove showed an improvement over the uh, baseline, but they claim in every case this model, Elmo, uh, performed better than the Cove model. So there is some lift to be had just from using the subword embeddings, but they claim they still set the state of the art because they were better than the Cove model. Does it matter that you first apply core model and then Elmo, or use baseline and then Elmo, or first Elmo and then baseline, the sequence? Um, so it says Elmo plus baseline here. Uh, realistically, uh, it's not really about order. It's just about uh, the Elmo representations being added to the representations used in the baseline model. You need to run the whole Elmo model to create those uh, embeddings first. But uh, order doesn't uh, matter in this case. Is that the question, or did I? Yeah. So the, uh, does it matter for the output, the in increase the, the increment that is showing relatively the last column? So does it matter if you change the sequence? Uh, by change the sequence, do you mean uh, switch around? So There's embedding the Elmo versus Elmo embedding. Um, in all of these are neural network models, and um, because they could, they have weights connected to all of the inputs, and could, are just a linear combination uh, before any nonlinearities. Um, the order doesn't matter because it's just you could even interleave the two representations: first element from base plus first element from LO, second element from base, and second element from LO, and you get the same results. Um, are are the baseline models uh, or embeddings? Uh, context aware or not? Uh, most of them were not context aware embeddings, and in some cases they weren't even embeddings, they were just one hot representations. Um, so you're right that in comparing this column with the Elmo plus baseline, it's not exactly an apples to apples comparison. Um, the, what they're saying is that using this technique, we've set new state of the art. Oh, one thing. Uh, so, uh, in 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 their baseline, isn't it the last layer? Uh, it's it's the representation in the last layer, right? You're just taking the representation in the last layer, and then you're concatenating Elmo to it. Now, you already since mm -hmm. you already have the representation in the last layer, it's not necessary. Not all of the baselines are about representations. Uh, some of these tasks don't even use embeddings. But if you, if you go back. Um, so baseline is not my vanilla model. Baseline is um, baseline from the paper. Uh, my vanilla model earlier on was strictly for example sake to talk to the group about language models. Sorry, I would. Do they give any specific examples on what I see? Um, how tax really played a role here, right, in, in some of the uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. My hearing's not so good today. A specific example, uh, like say they're comparing this would be um, uh, without context. So, so is there a case where it worked well? Uh, so what, when you went to when the Elmo and you, you take it into account the context. Um, like a, a test example that yeah, was yeah. accurate with, what was not, correct with the Elmo model and yeah. was inaccurate with them. Uh, good question, I don't have one for you. Um, I invite everyone to try it and tell me how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> So like, why aren't they satisfying? Why aren't they satisfying? I think you just wanted like a, uh, uh, you know, or like, yeah, just an empirical Intuitive. example. Yeah, Intuitively. Yeah. Yeah. Understanding yeah. maybe where it's working, where previous models were failing. I got you. No, the paper didn't present any uh, specific examples. Yeah. I mean, the biggest improvement is in question answering that you would expect to be a very context dependent. So intuitively, I would say that makes sense. Yeah. Can you just reiterate one more time exactly how the representations from Elmo are combined with the baseline models? Um, so the baseline models, um, well, let's use this terrible visual for a second. The, all of these five baseline models have as input some representation of language, whether one hot or uh, not. Um, the way it's combined is take the task-specific Elmo representation, which is co-trained along with the entire task model, and just append it to the input. If the input vector was 300 length for this one, and the Elmo representation was 100, it just takes the 300 and appends the 100 to the end. Directly at the input, directly at the input layer. Oh. 
Um, for these tasks, they're also appending it at the output layer because the output uses a word representation as well. And then you have to retrain the whole thing? Um, so you don't need to retrain the ELMO model. No, when, not the, the, like the actual model that you're trying to yeah. do. So in the, oops, do it this way. In these ELMO plus baseline or the hour baseline models, um, you're not um, training the baseline model first and adding ELMO. You're adding ELMO at the very beginning before you parameterize the, uh, the model at all. Mm -hmm. So it's co-trained along with all the other parameters. If some of those representations are using sparse input, would it not make sense to also compare using other pre-trained methods, um, concatenating input vectors with vectors coming from um, SX, et cetera? The only one that they uh, did, the only one that they talked about was uh, Cove, which uh, is a recent technique that they compare against, where they did the same task and they show better results than Cove. So, but yes, I, actually, I would love to see that as well. What are the results if we attach just one of the out of the box uh, context insensitive methods? I think someone may have asked this, but none of those baselines are using pre trained models, correct? Uh, no, well, none of these baselines are using pre trained models. These are the results reported in literature. This is their own re implementation of those baseline models, the results they got, and then what happened when they added ELMO to it. Hmm. Seems weird that they wouldn't have evaluated it with. Uh, agreed, uh, <laughs> but we all know how it is sometimes to get someone else's code working. Uh, I mean, if they attach ammo to the baseline, you need to more input, more features. Shouldn't they always input the performance? Because you get more features there. Oh, it would improve the performance if there was additional information to be gained. It, yeah. Yeah. So I think the claim is that it does provide more information, yeah. but. Um, is it is it ever the case that you only use ELMO? Like we have because uh, um, I would be curious to see, you know, like um, what kind of performance that would get. That's certainly a valid question, and there are times in the past when I've used strictly the embedding and not the original representation um, to reasonable effect. Um, they don't report on in the paper, but I'd be interested to see the same. You talk about the, the lift over each of the sort of baselines. Yeah. Is there also like a, an efficiency benefit here if you're taking a model essentially and then you have it want to apply it to a new task? There's actually a shorter engineering window of time, more shorter training time. Uh, something? They don't show the training curves. Um, I'd be interested to see what the training curves for their implementation of the models look like with and without ELMO to see if the relatively uh, potentially small number of additional um, parameters necessary for that input uh, corresponds to a faster training regime. I don't know. I would bet they, they would have talked about it. But that was <laughs> Good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering here, like, so, like, right now they're using a bi-directional language model, but yeah. when, when, like, we process language, we only have the benefit of one direction. Yeah. So I was just wondering, like, how much it would uh, decrease the performance if you just took out the backward direction. I'm not sure, but I'm going to challenge that a little bit. Um, when I'm reading, it's pretty standard to think about reading as strictly left to right, but the human eye, we do jump around, we refer back to information, we might go to the end of a sentence to see something. It's not, an, it's not exactly the same as uh, the forward back pass we're talking about here, but a lot of people don't read strictly sort of word one, then word two, then word three. So, so with speech, you know. with speech, it does limit us that way, yes. Um, to add to this question, there is language that starts from right to left, right? Uh, Urdu or Arabic, Farsi, which language? Yeah, but yeah, it, so it, it doesn't really, really help possible. because it doesn't matter. So, so for that case, um, the backward would be from left to right. Wouldn't someone's experience allow them to anticipate a potential end to a uh, potentially, yeah. Um, I think somebody should come up with a language which is written in a spiral, but, <laughs> but read in rays from the center. <laughs> Actually, there are languages that word order don't matter as much. So like in terms of yes. dead languages, Latin, yeah. it doesn't matter yeah. what, really so what I, the word order is. I lied when I said I didn't know any other languages. I do know a little bit of Latin and ancient Greek, and those highly inflected languages, uh, word order matters less. Mm -hmm. You're right. Sanskrit is one of them. Sanskrit the same? Yeah. yeah. 
um, where the, um, the word itself, the, the syntactic characteristics of the word indicate uh, parts of speech or grammar components like subject, object, verb, etc. So, But that information would all be like still be captured by a for the forward direction model, right? It would be captured by either because direction. Like the, or no matter how you swap the word orders, like it will just be in the, the, the conditional part of the probability. Uh, yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer is because we've set this up as a bidirectional problem from the start and from, from the front and from the back, um, and because it's an RNN processing it, order does matter to the way the sentence is processed, but in a language where more of the semantics are carried at the syntactic level on each word, yeah. um, you would expect the RNN hopefully to compensate for that in some way. Uh, how do you deal with the very, very long sentences? Uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Long sentences. Is it clear to um, So they talk about uh, using variable length backpropagation through time. Uh, for sort of as an option instead of looking at a whole sentence. We know that recurrent structures, though having a theoretical unbounded receptive field, in practice um, 30 or 40 is sort of the effective length of sequence that uh, RNNs are easily handle. Mm -hmm. um, so you could redefine context in that case. What do I mean by the context I'm providing? I could provide a fixed length window of words left and right of the token of interest. Um, I could say that it's the whole sentence, no matter how long it is. I could say that it's um, the whole sentence up to 20 words from the particular token I care about, but maybe fewer depending on sentence boundaries. Yeah, it's up to you to define context based on the needs of your problem. So basically, uh, is that possibly 